we are going to, and you can look at, we were on page 18. Let's see, no, actually we're on 17. And you can go through these. We have actually taught on Dr. Lake's life uh, before and actually doing, we'll be doing an entire series on it um, where we go into detail in these areas. <clears throat> but I want to take you, uh, actually we'll look at page, well, I guess we should do page 18. <clears throat> By the time, uh, and there, there was a whole lot that happened in South Africa, as we said, but when he returned to the United States, one of the things he did was he visited England. And in 1914, he actually, uh, after attending the Assemblies of God uh, formation, he also started what he called the International Apostolic Council. And that council was his, really what the ministry was formed around. And the whole idea was that it would not become a denomination, but would be an organization whereby men and women of God could come together and talk about doctrines that were going on in the church and come to a conclusion on these things. So it wasn't meant to be a heavy-handed, controlling thing. It was just a fellowship where people could come together. And so that is what uh, we have actually carried on now, and that is the actual basis of the ministry. Uh, technically, the name John G. Lake Ministries, uh, John Lake never used that. Uh, he used apostolic faith mission. He used the apostolic tabernacle, uh, the apostolic church. He used these different terms. He also used divine healing institute, divine healing rooms, uh, the healing rooms as they became known. So there were a lot of different things, that, uh, terms that he used. We use the term John J. Lake ministry so that people can know <clears throat> really how to find what Dr. Lake taught uh, and more about his life. Now, the family gave us the right to use the name. Matter of fact, we're the only ministry that they've ever given the right to use that name. Now, here <clears throat> I want to take you to uh, about the middle of page 18 in your manual <clears throat> when it talks about how whenever he arrived in uh, Spokane, and I'm, I know I'm backtracking just a little bit. The first session was trying to give you an overview, give you a few details. When he first uh, arrived in Spokane, he actually taught at what was called the Church of Truth. And at that time, that would have been what well, was called a New Thought Church, but it was because that's who invited him to speak. It didn't mean that he was in agreement with their doctrines or anything else. They just invited him because they'd heard of the results that he got in healing, and they believed in healing. Uh, nowadays, they would have been more like a Christian science church. And so he went there and preached, and people got healed, and he even got people saved and, and uh, filled with the Holy Spirit. And so he was moving in that direction. And... Shortly after that was whenever he moved downtown <clears throat> to the Rookery building where he started the healing rooms. Now, the thing about the healing rooms is very simple. Uh, <clears throat> a lot has been said about them over the years. The facts are very plain, and we've actually went and proved this out. Uh, the original, whenever John Lake left Spokane in uh, 1920, <clears throat> and then he returned there at about 1927. Now, he was back and forth and would go in at times, but his headquarters had moved to Portland. But by the time he had, he had returned, and we have to remember that in the 30s, uh, a fire had actually destroyed all of the buildings in downtown Spokane. And so they had to rebuild all the buildings. So what eventually was rebuilt as the Rookery building uh, was not the same building that John Lake was in when he was there. So pretty much what you've heard, if you've heard anything about the building in Spokane, it wasn't true. Uh, actually, he never set foot in that building and had nothing to do with it, and it was a completely different building. So, Now, the reason I'm saying that is because we need to realize that God is not interested in shrines. He's not interested in, in locations like that. Jesus didn't come to die for a building. He came to die for people. And the emphasis is on people, not on a place, right? And wherever two or three are gathered in his name, there he is, right? It's real simple. So you don't have to go to a place, you know, to, to experience the presence of God. And really that's the whole point of it. So uh, <clears throat> that's why we bring that out. Now, let's move on because we have uh, actually during that time, I would tell you, from 1914 to 1920, he taught a series of lectures that normally lasted 30 days. Those series of lectures he called the Science of Divine Healing. 
Now, the one thing you have to remember is if you go back to that time period, science was big. I mean, it was, everything was scientific, everything, you know, electricity was, was uh, I wouldn't say it's brand new, but it was new enough that there was still a lot of mystique to it. And so uh, he's really calling it the science of divine healing because he broke it down and made it so simple. And what he required was if you wanted to learn healing or be healed, then you had to agree to come to the classes every day for 30 days. And when I say every day, that meant Monday through Friday, and they would only be teaching for about an hour, maybe an hour and a half uh, on each day. And then Saturdays and Sundays, they would not uh, have classes. They would have church services. And at his church services, he would actually have uh, demonstration services, meaning that they would purposely minister healing as a demonstration of the power of God. The meetings got so large in Spokane that they had to find a bigger building. And the only, only building in Spokane at the time that would hold the crowd was the local Masonic Lodge. And so they started having their meetings in the Masonic temple there. Now, <clears throat> automatically that violates some people's idea of where God can work. Right? Um, but he had some tre tremendous, matter of fact, there, we have one testimony on the day or <clears throat> right by the day that he gave a prophecy, which was the reason why the family passed the ministry to me. Uh, he met with a, a woman that was holding a child in her arms out in front of the, on, on the property of the Masonic Lodge there. And the child had no foot and it was just uh, actually shorter and there was no foot. And while he was standing there, he prayed for the child and turned to walk off. And we turned and the mother screamed and we turned back around. The child had a foot. And so the mother put the child down and the child was learning how to walk. They had to learn the balance and all that kind of stuff. But it was uh, such a notable miracle that um, it, it caused an even bigger crowd that next Sunday at the Masonic Lodge. And it happened on the grounds of the Masonic Lodge. So. Like we said before, where sin does abound, grace does much more abound. So no matter where it is, right, God can work if he has people that he can work through. Amen? Amen? Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> now let's go on. Um, he actually started uh, healing rooms in Sacramento. He, started, he was in Sacramento for a time. And he also started healing rooms in uh, San Diego and different places all through. And so he actually spoke in uh, Los Angeles at E.W. Kenyon's church when Kenyon was down there. So there's, there's all these men were kind of tied together at one point. And, you know, I don't know what you've heard about E.W. Kenyon. I've heard good and bad. I've investigated, talked with the family, done some research. Uh, the accusations made against him were unfounded, and that's been proven. There's actually a good book out on that that, that also proves it. But um, <clears throat> during that time, he left, and whenever he passed away in uh, 1935, his wife, Florence, actually lived until 1964. And so she outlived him quite a bit. And they had a total of 12 children uh, between his first wife and his second wife. First wife had seven, second wife had five. And, and Gertrude, uh, which was his daughter, Lake's daughter, actually married a man named Wilford Wright, R-E-I-D-T, Wright. And they were married. Wilford came into John Lake's ministry about 1931. And then they got married, uh, Wilford and Gertrude got married in 1941. And so after they got married, then they started kind of pulling everything together they could of Dr. Lakes, uh, including uh, prophetic material, things that have been said, uh, tongues, interpretations, letters, sayings, sermons, all this stuff started gathering all of it together and compiling it. Well, <clears throat> that kind of brings us up to today. Now, if you look on page 21, it has a history of the John G. Lake Healing Rooms, gives you the details that I just mentioned. Um, <clears throat> then on page 23, this was a prophetic word given by John G. Lake on Thursday, May 24th, 1934, about a year before he died. And in this, he describes a person that the family believed fit me. And I'll tell you why here shortly. But this, was, this prophecy was the reason why the ministry was handed to us. And there are some details in here that are very specific, and that's why uh, they gave it to us. So now turn to page 25. You should go in and read that prophecy at some point because it gives you some insight into some things. But on page 25, it has how and why I, I entered the ministry. And as we said earlier, uh, I was born on April 1st, and next week will be my 57th birthday, and that was in 1959. 
Uh, I was an only child. And then at 17 months old, we were at a family reunion. Actually, recently I was uh, with my mother and we were going over some details, just talking about some of these things. And my mother gave me a lot more details of things that went on during the day-by-day -day stuff at the hospital. So it was kind of kind of interesting to me anyway. Um, don't know if it'd be as interesting to you, but whenever I was at the, uh, we were at a family reunion and my dad went out to go to a store uh, because of all the people around, uh, nobody saw me actually get out and I got out and followed him out. He didn't see me and as I was going around behind the car as he backed out, he backed out over me. And when he backed out over me, it caught me right where the wheel, wheel well is and grabbed my hair, actually it was on this side to pull it, and grabbed the hair and pulled me up into the wheel well. Because of that, it ripped this ear completely off. It was ripped from here across the top to the top of this ear and all of the part where it was ripped, the scalp, all came down to about my eyes. So it's all pulled out, so all the skin was pulled down. Uh, <clears throat> whenever he heard that he hit something, he, he heard it. He got out and looked, I was lying under the car, not moving. He panicked, ran back in the house and was yelling, I've killed our baby, I've killed the baby. And so the whole family all came out. My grandfather uh, saw me, picked me up, picked up my ear, which was actually part of the scalp, also was lying on the side of the ground. Uh, picked us up, picked me and my ear up and put me in his truck and then took me about three blocks to the local hospital. When I got there, the doctor, and you have to remember my dad was uh, 17 at the time, my mom was 16. Uh, as I said, I was an, I'm an only child, still an only child. And <clears throat> whenever I got there, the doctor told my parents, uh, there's too much damage, he, there's no way he can live. Uh, just get ready to bury him and you know, set, settle it in yourself that you're gonna lose him. And then he went in to try to do some work and do what he could. <clears throat> After a bit of time, he came back out and said, you know, uh, he actually may live. And now when he went back in to do work, my mom went to praying. My mom was a Pentecostal uh, and she began praying. And she said, God, we dedicate him to you. So if you will let him live, I will raise him and train him to serve you. And so let him live. <clears throat> doctor came out and said, you know, it looks like he might live. And they, he said, but even if he does, he will have so much brain damage done because of this that he will never be normal in any way. You'll have to feed him, clothe him, take care of him, do everything. And so <clears throat> that's, that would be what you'd have to do. And so then he went back in to do some more surgery and my mom went back to pray and said, God, that's not good enough. If you're going to let him live, then let him be normal. And I always tell everybody it's still up for debate as to whether I'm normal or not, but even if I'm not, it's working for me. Amen. So, um, and then after a bit longer, he came back out and said, you know, uh, he, he was never unconscious that we could tell. Uh, so we're not sure how much brain damage there would be, but even if there isn't any brain damage, he will never have any hearing in his right ear and he will never have any hair. And he went back in, my mom went back to praying and I said, God, if you're going to let him live, you're going to let him be normal, let him hear, let him have hair. Well, got plenty of hair, got perfect hearing in my right ear. You can even see the scar, the uh, scar here where he sewed it back on. And then I got a good scar that goes all the way across the top of my head and one across the back. The, the scalp was actually, because it wasn't cut, it wasn't neat. It was ripped. And when it rips, it rips different. So when I went in the military, they shaved my head. I looked like Frankenstein. I mean, it was just, had cuts and everything. And you can still see a good, well, you can probably see it right there. There's a good cut right there. So when my hair is short enough, you can see it. And my wife said, you know, tell him not to cut it quite that short. And I'm like, no, it's good. It's a testimony. Somebody says, ooh, what happened? I talked to him. Uh, I've never been to a, to a barber or a hair cutter yet uh, that I didn't end up giving my whole life story and my whole testimony to. So it's, <laughs> it's an open door because I have to tell him I got some scars there. So you got to kind of work around that. So <clears throat> anyway, uh, whenever, uh, so after about six, roughly six hours of surgery, 172 stitches were all the way across. My head swelled up like a basketball. Uh, my eyes were swollen shut. Actually, for, for about the first week at least, I think it might have been more than that, my mom said, uh, I was actually blind that I could not see uh, because of all the swelling and stuff that was going on. And so the first time she noticed that I could see, she was actually, I was walking, we were walking down the hall and she was holding my hand and I saw two, uh, I don't know what I saw, I mean, but there were two nurses coming toward us 
And I kept pulling my mom's hand and said, Mom, uh, Mama, pretty, pretty. Talking about the nurses, I guess. I don't, I don't know. And she said, but that was the first time she knew I could actually see again. Uh, so I was getting my vision back. And so <clears throat> whenever, uh, over a period of time, uh, being an only child, my mom being as young as she was, uh, and really the whole rest of the family, uh, I was uh, treated very good. Let me put it that way. Okay? Some would say, my, my, my cousins, they all say I'm spoiled. That's not true. Right? It wasn't true. Uh, <clears throat> I, I say I was favored of God. Anyway, so, but, um, so as I grew up, my mom, uh, when I was supposed to start school, I didn't start school right away. I didn't go through kindergarten or any of that kind of stuff. But my mom started teaching me how to read by using the King James Bible. And so all the time as I was growing up, before I ever entered school, we had already read through the Bible. Uh, my mom was, we were trying to talk about this the other day, somewhere between four and eight times before I started school, we had read through the whole Bible. As we grew up, my mom taught me how to read by using it. At first she would read it to me, then she had me read it to her. Uh, in the beginning, she would read me to sleep with it, and then later on, I would read her to sleep with it, actually. Uh, and I always thought about, I'm still reading people to sleep with the Bible. It still works. So, <clears throat> but if you're going to go to sleep, this is the right place to do it, right? You may close your eyes and can't see me. You may close your mouth. You won't be talking to me, but you can't close your ears. And while you sleep, I'm still getting to you, right? So <clears throat> now, if you fall asleep, we'll leave you asleep. We, we, even when we go to lunch, we're going to leave you asleep, right? So <laughs> you just miss lunch. So, uh, but during that time, <clears throat> I didn't know it, but the, the word was getting put in me. And then as I grew up, when I was nine years old, I got saved, actually walked across the street to a Nazarene church. We were actually Southern Baptist uh, and then had some Pentecostal uh, input. But um, there was a Nazarene church right across the street from where we lived. My parents worked at nine. Uh, I went across the street, went to the church. And whenever the pastor gave the altar call, I went down front, gave my life to Christ. And from that time in, I'd always known God was with me. Um, you know, I knew he loved me, knew he spared me. My mom told me, you know, that God spared your life. He's got something planned for you. Obviously, you wouldn't be here, you know, things like that. So uh, <clears throat> then I went into the military. And whenever, while I was in the military, God started dealing with me about preaching. And <clears throat> so finally, uh, when I, I went in as a security police law enforcement specialist, went into pararescue and was moving that direction, following my dad's, my earthly dad's footsteps. And God started dealing with me and saying, I've called you to do this. And so whenever I got out, <clears throat> we started, actually, I didn't know which direction to, to take. Um, and and you know, trying to make this kind of short anyway, but the, we had, um, <clears throat> I didn't, uh, I, I knew I had to preach and I knew I had to be quick. Uh, my dad at that, time, at that point said, uh, well, well, we'll put you through Dallas Theological Seminary. We'll pay your way to go through that. I said, no, you don't, you don't get it. Um, I don't have time for that. I got to start preaching. And he said, well, if you don't go to school, nobody's going to let you preach in their churches. I said, well, I'm not trying to get in their churches. I said, I'll preach on the street corner. He said, Curry, nobody does that. He said, well, there are people who do that, but you're, you're not like them, right? And we're not like them, right? That was his idea. And I'm like, well, I may be more like them than you think, <laughs> you know, so. But um, <clears throat> eventually, I, actually, I did not go to uh, Bible school at that time. I visited a couple of churches, uh, the first church I went to was a free will Baptist church. And at that time in the military, all you can have is a mustache. And so I had a mustache. And so when I went to the uh, free will Baptist church, the pastor told me if God, if I want to serve God, first thing I had to do was shave my mustache because God could not use me if I had hair on my face. I never saw where he got that from the Bible. All right. But uh, even at that age, I was smart enough to leave there and never go back. Amen. All right. Because I figured if, 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 if this could stop God, then we're all in trouble, right? <laughs> so um, ended up, and at that time I was teaching martial arts uh, to make a living, and that was my profession at the time. And that was how I met my wife was I was teaching her sister's boyfriend private lessons. And so I went to his house to teach a private lesson. They were there, met her. Uh, within a month after I met her, uh, it took me a month to convince her to go out with me. We had our first date on April 22nd, and then uh, actually by October 10th and the 15th, we were married. You say, what do you mean October 10th and 15th? We had two weddings, one on the 10th and one on the 15th, right? The one on the 10th, 
was very quick. In other words, I thought I, I was going to go to work for the uh, Texas Department of Corrections, and I didn't think they were going to let me be there for the 15th. So I said, if we're going to get married, we got to do it now. So we went to the church we were visiting, woke up our pastor at almost midnight, called my parents, got my best friend as a witness, got married in the uh, church office there. And then the next week, my wife's grandfather, who was a Baptist minister, was going to, supposed to marry us. And we got there. Nobody knew on their side of the family. My side of the family, they all heard. So on my side, there was nobody. On her side, everybody was there. And everybody looked at me like, oh, he was an orphan. You know, yeah, but, you know so. But it's because everybody knew we were already married. So, and, uh, so we got married. And then within, a, well, after actually about a year, almost a year and a half after that, we had our first child, and our first child's name was Erica Dawn Blake. She was born on November 17th in 1978. And so when she was born, all, all during the pregnancy, uh, the pregnancy was really good. It was a good pregnancy with no problems, nothing. Uh, when they did the sonograms and all that kind of stuff, everything looked good, no, nothing wrong. <clears throat> when she was born, she was born with a hemangioma tumor. I mean, literally, even minutes before she was born, when they did the sonogram, it was not visible. It was, it, there was, they don't know how they missed it, actually. And when she was born, she was born with this hemangioma tumor, which is a tumor made up of blood vessels kind of in a, in a knot, okay? And when she was born, that tumor was about the size of my fist. And what made it unusual was where it was at because it, there are people that have hemangiomas in different places. Hers was the first child ever recorded that it was actually in her tongue. And so because of that, when she was born, her tongue was about the size of my fist and it was outside of her mouth. It was blood red. I mean, it was a deep red and it was very horrible to look at. It was, it was, it was a surprise to everybody. The doctor was surprised. We were surprised. Everything. So uh, because they'd never seen one there, they didn't know exactly what to do. So immediately they knew they had to do a tracheotomy because otherwise she couldn't breathe. And so they did a tracheotomy and then we had to schedule a, a, a plane a small plane to take us from here, from, actually from Sherman, Texas, where she was born, down to Galveston to John Seeley Children's Hospital. So we got in this plane, flew down, uh, and put her in the hospital there. I was working at the time uh, here at Texas Instruments, and I'd, I, I, we had to take her to the hospital. My wife stayed in the hospital, literally slept in the waiting room, <clears throat> and I would go down on the weekends, and then I had to come back and work. And then so every weekend I would either fly down or my family and my mom and dad and I would all drive down. And so we went back and forth. And then eventually I ended up going down there and staying with her about the last four months she was uh, there. And on my birthday uh, in 1979, yeah, I'm trying to make sure I get all these dates right. As a historian, dates are big to me. All right. So um, and then on that date, they came to us and they said, um, we can let her out on this day, but you're going to have to make arrangements to pay the bill. And the bill at that time, now this, you have to remember this is back in the 70s, was $186,000, $188,000, which we had nothing. We had no insurance. We had no money. We had nothing. And so they said, well, we got to make some arrangements before we will release her. So basically they were holding her hostage, essentially. And so we started praying. And I said, okay, uh, God, we need some help. Well, within two days, the uh, American Medical Association came and said, if you will let us uh, document her case and put it in the AMA journal, then we will take care of your entire bill. And we said, okay. So we signed the paper so she is in the AMA Medical Journal uh, because of where the tumor was located. We brought her home. They told us all kinds of things about her, told us that she would never be able to uh, eat normally, that she would never, if, that if she grew teeth, that it was, it was uh, not likely that she would actually grow teeth, but if she did, if she ever cut into the tumor, she would bleed to death. We would have to live within uh, just a couple of minutes from the hospital or else she would bleed to death before we got her there. So our whole life was centered around the medical facilities that could deal with her. And so, and, but there were many, many times, many times, uh, we would wake up and there would be blood everywhere. And because whenever you cut a tumor like that, it bleeds. And it looked like somebody had been murdered. I mean, there would be blood everywhere because it would just shoot out. 
And so we had to learn how to stop that and put pressure on it. My wife had to learn how to deal with the tracheotomy, how you have to sit, you had a suction machine, you have to go in, clean it out, all that kind of stuff. My wife had to go through nursing school for that. So all this stuff at 17, 18, and now 18 and 19 years old. Uh, no, but no parent should ever have to go through that, especially with their first child, especially at that age, because uh, you have to go up real, grow up real quick when you do that. And so we uh, were moving forward. Now, during that time, uh, she grew teeth. She could eat food. I mean, it was even the doctors were astounded. As we started seeing this, I knew that God had spared me when I was a child. I knew he had saved my life. And so we started praying, God, we need her to be healed. But we didn't know how to get it to happen. You know, we knew God c could heal. We knew he would heal. We just didn't know how to make it happen when we needed it. And so we started searching healing. And that's why I started looking everywhere. Um, if anybody had a healing ministry, we checked it out. We went there. We've been everywhere. Everybody prayed for her. Uh, <clears throat> I could give you names. I mean, all the big names prayed for her. We were in every meeting. We were there. We had people lay hands on her, pray for everything. People knew us because of her. And as we move forward, the thing is we were getting, we were winning. We were actually beating this thing. And the tumor was actually getting smaller, but there'd be times it'd be smaller and then it would kind of get big again, but then it goes back. And when it got smaller, it gets smaller again and it would come back big and then get smaller again. So we were winning. The problem is we didn't win fast enough. And so in February of 1981, uh, she was a little over two years old. Uh, she actually developed double pneumonia. And within, actually, uh, actually called the hospital, called the doctor. And the doctor, because it was late at night, the doctor said, keep her cool and just bring her in first thing in the morning. I'll look at her. Well, in the morning, she was dead. And so uh, she died on actually Friday the 13th of February, 1981. And the doctor was, um, well, actually the funeral home were very concerned because of her tongue. They didn't know what was going to happen. And, and uh, as, as the body would begin to deteriorate, they were afraid it was going to do something. So they said, we got two choices. We can bury her very quickly, or we can remove the tongue, and then we can take the normal process. And we said, no, this is how she's born. This is how she'll be buried. And said, so we agreed that she would be buried the next day, which was Saturday, February 14th, which is Valentine's Day. And so now before this, <clears throat> her, my wife's grandmother had made a, a little bonnet that had like buttons on the side that she put this, built this thing, made this thing, but she didn't build it, she made it. Uh, that was like a, 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 not a mask, but it was something that w could hold her tongue that when we went out in public, because if we didn't have that, people would stare and it was very, very bad. Uh, it was, it would be scary to small children, things like that, because it was very horrible to look at. And so they put that on it, and we had to keep her tongue wet because it would dry out and crack and bleed. So we had to put this bonnet thing on her with this cloth piece to go over her tongue, and we had to keep that wet so that it would keep it moist all the time. And this was normal. And we'd be pushing her in a stroller in the mall somewhere, and people would still look, but they couldn't see what was going on. But then there were times that she didn't like it on, like any other child, and she would pull this thing off. And we could tell when she did because of people's responses and things. And so uh, just before she died, as a matter of fact, we were in Sulphur, Louisiana, had gone down to help start a church there. And while we were preaching in a home upstairs, they had the children up in a, up in a room upstairs. And there was a, one night while I was preaching, a friend of mine and I were tag team preaching. And while I was preaching, we heard some people's uh, children scream. So my friend took over and we went upstairs. And when we got there, there was a little girl that, a visitor uh, that was had screamed and when I walked in my daughter was over on the one side of the room and I'll never forget it because it was one of those defining moments when you realize something because I for the first time I recognized that she recognized that she wasn't normal and because when I walked in uh, the little girl had screamed when she had seen her and so my daughter just automatically had covered her face with her arm so that she could hide because she knew what the problem was. And for me, for any parent, that's just uh, one of those break points. And so um, we immediately, uh, again, we'd been seeking healing, going after it, studying it, learning, getting results. 
And then we moved back here to Texas and then she passed away and we buried her on Valentine's Day there just up here in McKinney at the cemetery on the side of the highway here. As we stood there, everybody else had already walked off with this little white casket. It was cold. Uh, they were putting the casket down the ground. They usually don't like the parents to stay there while they do that, but we did. And I remember I grabbed my wife's hand and we were standing there because we had called everybody. We, I had called around. Everybody that had prayed for her, we tried to get her on the telephone. We couldn't reach them. Uh, different things which upset me, and I understand it now, but it was not easy to get over at the time. And I kept trying to get somebody that either knew how to raise the dead or do something. I'd heard all these stories, and I couldn't find anybody that was even willing to try. And so when we stood there, I remember I took my wife's hand, and I said, and I made a vow to God. And I told him, I said, God, there was no man for me when I needed one. But if you will teach me the truth about divine healing, I will be that man for someone else so that they don't have to have a grave like I do. And so that kind of launched us. Now, I'd heard about John Lake. I'd heard about Smith Wigglesworth. I'd heard about all these amazing miracles. Wigglesworth was an amazing man. But when I heard about Lake, something stood out. Uh, because not only did he get people healed, but he taught it. And the people that he taught it to got the same results he did. And being in martial arts, you know, I know there's good fighters and then there's good teachers. And sometimes good fighters aren't good teachers and sometimes good teachers aren't good fighters. But when you find a fighter that can teach, that's who you want to train under. And so I immediately started trying to find out more about him and wouldn't you know it, he died in 1935. And so I said, okay, well, here's what we need to do. So I started finding the family and I, I finally got a hold of Gertrude and Will, her husband, and started calling them and asking them questions. And it got to a point where every Monday, usually every Monday, uh, I would call them and we would talk for an hour or two. I'd have a whole list of questions. I would ask them questions. I never asked them about John Lake's anointing. I never asked about gifts of the Spirit. I asked, what did he teach? What, how did he pray? What did he say about things? What did he believe about things? Because I figured, you know, I really couldn't dictate anointing. I couldn't dictate gifts, but if I could find what he believed and what he did that put him in a position where God could use him, then I could put myself in the same position and maybe God would use me. And so I started searching. Well, we, we had a relationship for about seven years. Uh, they gave me a bunch of names to call different people and I asked all these questions and they would answer them. And then the, at the end of the, that day, I would, uh, for the rest of the week, I would go and I recorded all their, their questions. That's back when we had the little uh, cassette tapes. And, the, you know, to record that, you could take this little suction cup thing that had a wire you stick in the side and you put it onto the phone and it would actually record the, the, the conversation. And so I recorded all these, most of them anyway. And so uh, I would listen to, to their answers and then I would, you know, just automatically have different questions the next week. And so this was an ongoing <coughs> thing pretty much every week for seven years. And so finally, uh, just before Gertrude passed away, Will said, um, what's your testimony? And so I said, well, when I was a child, I got hit by a car and I was supposed to be dead and but God spared my life and did this and I gave him the details. And he said, well, when did that happen? And I said, well, I, I don't know. He said, can you find out? And I thought, well, that, that's weird. You know, I said, yeah, I guess so. I can call my mom and find out. He said, well, get a hold of her and find out and then let me know. And so I, when we got off the phone, I called my mom and I said, D can you find out what day that was I got hit by the car? She said, oh yeah, September 16th, 1960. And I'm like, how do, you, how do you know that? You know, just off the top of your head. She goes, there are some days you just never forget. And I'm like, yeah, because I buried my daughter. I'm like, yeah, I, I, I get that. And so I called Will back and I said, it was on uh, September 16th, 1960. I said, yeah, that's what I thought. I said, what you thought? What do you mean? What you th how would you think that? He said, well, there was a prophecy that Dr. Lake gave before he passed away that detailed who was supposed to pick up his ministry and carry it on. He said, you fit that. And Gertie and I thought that you did, but we wanted to be sure. And so they asked questions. And so after that, they started sending me everything. They sent me letters, uh, sermons that he had written, all these things. All of the sermons, every sermon you have ever read that has been published, has been edited, right? None of them are the unedited. Now, uh, Kenneth Copeland put out a book on uh, John Lake and it had his sermons. And in the beginning, it says that they have not edited it. They, that is true. It was edited before they got it, right? 
um, when Gordon Lindsay went through most of these, all the books put out by Gordon Lindsay, and it says on the front, edited by Gordon Lindsay. It says it. He also edited all the ones that ended up getting to the Copelands and different people. So the information that's been put out there, nobody did it on purpose necessarily. Uh, however, Gordon Lindsay edited a lot out. And the amazing thing is <clears throat> what we teach that makes this work so well are the parts he edited out. Okay, and you say, well, why did he do that? Because at the time, the things that he said or that were in, that Dr. Lake had preached were, went so against the grain that people would have rejected it outright. And so Gordon made it acceptable and it did help. A lot of people gleaned a lot from what's out there. But recently, as a matter of fact, uh, now we have a, a printer and now we are going to be publishing all of the original unedited sermons in their entirety, and we're not going to touch them. Now, it is also going to raise a lot of questions because of the way he said things. And so what we're going to do is, I'm not going to touch the text, but I'm going to put notes, like at the bottom, that will actually detail who he was talking to, when it was, and that kind of thing. Because how many of you know, if somebody took everything you wrote down when you were 15, and then looked at it again when you were you know, 40, uh, there may be a little bit of difference in them, because hopefully you grew. Well, that the same thing takes place in ministry and you grow over a period of time and you learn uh, how to say things better. OK, and so that's what we will be doing. It's just showing when they were when they were uh, preached and who he, who he was talking to, because you can talk to one group. You can have the exact same message, but the way you say it to one group will come out different than how you would say it to another group. Right? And that's what happens a lot of times. And, and see, people don't know that. So they just take what he said and stretch it out there and makes it sound crazy sometimes. I mean, just, you know, some things, the way he said it was just not the right way to say it. So we're going to detail those things. We're not going to touch the text because we think it's important that you get the full unedited version of it. So we are putting all these together. Uh, on the average, you will find about 45 to 50 uh, sermons of Dr. Lake that have been published. We have over 120. Right? And so there are a lot of them. Now, some of them are the same sermon with a different title, preached at a different time, but each thing is a little different. So we're going to publish all of them because there are nuggets you can find in each one that are good. And so we're going to be putting all these things out. When they sent me this box of stuff, um, <clears throat> actually for years what I did was I made copies of it when I got it and then I gave it to my parents because we moved a lot. And my parents were pretty stationary and so I left it. And this last time I was with my mom, I got all this stuff back. And so <clears throat> I was getting all this and we're trying to uh, bring it all together because we have uh, names. Right after they sent me this list of names, there were over 100 people that had been in Dr. Lake's church and had been trained by him to, you know, to some degree or other. And so I got that list. I started calling. Now, when I got that list, <clears throat> I got the list roughly 87. Yeah, uh, end of 87, beginning of 88. Gertrude passed away in November of 87. Will lived until June of 88. And so I had all of that during that time period. Well, as I got those lists, I started finding these people. Well, the list had well over 100 names, but there were some of them that had already passed away. And so we started going through them, making phone calls uh, all over. And, and I had a list of questions that I asked each person. Because I figured if you ask everybody the same question, then the answers you get that are similar would be absolutely the truth. And anything else might be personal remembrances or something, or you could allow for a certain degree of variance. And so I started looking at those things. And then in 1995, I went down to uh, Alvin, Texas, to hear Pauline Parham, which was Charles Parham's daughter-in-law, to hear her preach. <clears throat> While I was there, we were just outside of Houston, Texas, and I said, you know, uh, there were some people on the list that were in Houston. So we started looking for them. I found one that was still alive. She was in a nursing home. She was 90, 92, 93 years old at that time. And so I went to visit her and I started asking her the same questions. And after about the second day of me being able to go there and just spend time there, I, I think I was starting to aggravate her a bit and she was kind of getting fed up with me. So finally she said, well, if you just had the manual, all your questions would be answered. I said, well, yeah, that'd be great. If you know, if I had a manual, that'd be perfect. But where, where can I find one of those? Oh, well, I got one. 
You know, and it's, I felt like, yeah, okay, I'm going to show my age here. I felt like Red Fox, right? It's kind of like that. You know, here, here we, you know, <laughs> you, well, what do you mean you got one? She goes, oh, yeah, I got, I got a manual. I said, well, can I have it? She said, no, you can't have it. She said, you can, you can read it. Uh, and she, she said, but you can't have it till I die. And so her family brought it up, and I got to sit there by her bed and make notes as much as I could. And then when I left, uh, kind of jokingly, please understand, okay, but I've said it before that it took me about two years to pray her to death <laughs> because I really wanted that manual. <laughs> you know, Lord, she's really old. Lord, she's lived way past 70. She deserves her reward, Lord. Please, please. You know, so, um, so eventually she died. And uh, when she did, about, it was about two years later, uh, the family actually sent me the manual. And so that's whenever I took it. We were up here in... Um, in uh, Denison, Texas, actually living out near a lake area. And I'll never forget it, putting it down on my kitchen table and sitting there and starting going through it. And I started making notes. And immediately all I did was change the way I prayed. And that's when we saw the success rate jump. And then we started implementing more and more as we went. And we started seeing changes take place. And essentially, uh, <clears throat> over the period of time, we'll talk more about this too as we go. But over the period of time, I started noticing similarities because all John Lake did was discard the traditions that they had built up. And in their day, they were like, you know, well, they had many questions, but they had questions like, does God still heal? Well, most of you, I mean, if you're here, you believe God heals. So that wouldn't be a question we would have to really, you know, go after, right? But there were some other things, you know, does, does God heal everybody? Well, now that's one that today could fit right in. And so... But I started noticing his, um, his method was simply to find uh, all the things that people said, uh, the traditions, and then he went into the Bible and disproved them. And so then that's pretty much what we started looking at was, why don't people get healed? What, what is the reason people say people don't get healed? And so we started looking at that, and every answer that we got there we started going into it and saying, okay, what does the Bible say about this? And we started going back and finding scripture that actually contradicted that. So we decided to not believe that. We decided to believe the scripture, and then we went and did it. And when we went and did it, it worked. And so we started eliminating these, what we call now sacred cows, right? And the reason we call it a sacred cow, of course, is because in India, they have cows walking down the street, and they're sacred, so they can't kill them. And yet people are starving to death while these cows walk by. And, you know, being raised in Texas, guess what? We, we know how to barbecue a cow or two, right? And so we don't have any problem with that, okay? And so we started calling them sacred cows, and we started eliminating or killing these sacred cows. And so uh, we started talking about this back in <clears throat> early, well, late 1990, I guess 97, 98, is when we first started calling them sacred cows. And, and I'll be honest with you, the idea actually came from a book the, the title of the book was Kicking Over Sacred Cows by Charles Capps. And so the idea of sacred cows, that led me to the understanding of what a sacred cow was. And so, um, so we continued to uh, study on healing. A lot of our family thought we would walk away from God after Erica died, but instead we dove in and we wanted truth. And so uh, before Erica died, uh, we had um, our son John. And then when Erica died, ex almost exactly nine months later, we had our second daughter, uh, Crystal, and she was an identical twin of Erica, except perfectly healthy. I mean, amazing how, and we had family members say, well, that makes you almost want to believe in reincarnation. I said, no, it makes me believe in a good God, right? The, the devil took Erica's life and God replaced it, right? God didn't take our baby. He didn't kill our daughter, right? That was the devil. Now, just because the devil killed her doesn't mean she went to hell. She went to be with the Lord, right? Uh, but you know, it was the devil that took her life. And so uh, I've, I've made it a commitment on my part to make her life the, the costliest life the devil ever took, Amen. right? And we have gone out many times, and you say, well, this, that didn't sound right to say this. There have been many times before I laid hands on people, I said, I would stop and I'd say, you know what, Erica, this is for you. And I would lay hands on them for that. Now, I'm still, I'm believing in the, the atoning sacrifice of Christ. I'm believing, my faith is in Christ. It has nothing to do with my daughter. Please understood. But I wanted to just, as we would say here in Texas, I wanted to rub the devil's nose in it, right? I wanted him to regret, you know, as David Hogan always says, you know, devil, you just shouldn't have, oughtn't have, hadn't have done that, 
you know, and that, that's kind of the way I felt about it, okay? So, now, uh, then after that, now, Eric, uh, Crystal was born October uh, 20th in 1981, and then my last daughter, uh, Rebecca, was born on November 6th, 1982, and so those are our three living children, had a total of four. Uh, my son is the oldest. He was actually born on March 9th in 1980, and so... Uh, that's kind of our whole family. Uh, after four, my wife said, okay, we're done. We're, that's good. Yeah, right, that's plenty. Because as an only child, I always wanted a big family. And she said, well, that's big enough. You want more, you know, go start an orphanage. And so <laughs> that's where we stopped was at the four. So, um, but now we've been traveling and ministering. And there's, uh, in your manual, you will see uh, many of the, of the testimonies that we have. We'll be talking about some of those as we come up. The reason I give testimonies is for one reason. It's not so you go, ooh, ah, uh, or think of us as anything. The whole point about this is that whatever we've done, you can do, right? Uh, we do it by faith in God, faith in his word, doing his word. It's that simple. We don't claim a special anointing, special gift, none of that, right? The only difference possibly between us is experience. And we're here to help you get that experience. And so we're going to train you, teach you, get you going. Um, but as we go, as I tell these testimonies, every testimony I tell will be for a principle or a truth in it that you need to learn, right? Has nothing to do with just giving just a testimony. It has to do with you learning something from it. Because remember, these are testimonies of victory, but a lot of the nuggets that you will learn came because somebody died. Because you don't analyze your victories. You analyze your failures. And so a lot of the nuggets we've learned was because someone died and we went back and said, why didn't it work? What was going on? And then we, we found something, go, ah, Okay, there it is. And so we start including these in. So every nugget generally costs somebody their life. So that's why we try to bring them out so that we don't have more losses. We have more victories than we do losses. Honestly, we're, we're not having quite as many dead raisings. I've seen nine come back from the dead. We're not having quite as many, but it's because now they get healed rather than dying, which is always good. Amen. I, you know, I mean, if, if I said, who wants to volunteer for me to pray for you to get healed? Everybody come running. If I said, who wants to be raised from the dead? First, you got to die. Nobody volunteers. So, all right. Anyway, all right. Well, we're going to take a quick break and uh, we'll be back. We'll, uh, again, I'm keeping it pretty close. You've got 10 minutes when you break. So, you coming up top? <laughs> 